What are you looking at? What? What is it? You find something amusing? Something bothering you? What are you looking at? This isn't comfortable for me, you know, being here, being like this. It isn't an easy thing to do. What are you looking at? You know, your stairs, they certainly don't make it any easier. Look, I don't exactly want to be this way, okay? But I've got my reasons. I'm restrained. I'm restrained because, because I want to be, all right? I want to be. But I don't want to be. It's crazy, right? And you, you probably think I'm crazy, don't you? Don't you? Yeah. Well, maybe I am. Maybe I am crazy. But at least, at least I'm safe. At least I'm protected. You know, I might be trapped, but at least I'm not vulnerable. I hate being vulnerable. You know, I used to be vulnerable. I used to trust people. What a joke. You know, not anymore. Not since my father, he was drunk. He was always drunk, of course. And it just it never seemed to matter. And, and she didn't do anything wrong. She never did, but he wouldn't stop. He wouldn't stop hitting her. And, and there was screaming. And there was swearing and, and punching. And, and I screamed, and I asked him to stop. And I, and I remember I, he, he kept hitting, and he kept screaming. And my mom, she, she pleaded, and, she, and she, she begged him to stop and quit, and he just, he just wouldn't. And then she stopped. She stopped moving. She stopped breathing. He moved away soon after that, and, and life, was, life was never really the same. Well, actually, that's a lie. It was, it was nothing but the same. More drinking, more hurting. My fiancé left me. After six years, just like that, just a note on the table. Why? Why would you leave me for him? I loved you. I needed you. I depended on you. Why? My insides hurt. It feels so sore. It's like I miss her so much. That's why... I don't trust anyone anymore because nothing can relieve the pain. Nothing. I know that now. So that's why I'm trapped. I keep to myself. I trust no one. Not my fiance, not my father, not my friends. No one anymore. I can't. And I know what you're thinking. You should give your pain to God. Trust him. Yeah, but prayers are a wasted breath. Because I know if God really loved me, if he really cared, he wouldn't have let all of this stuff happen to me. Would he? Would he? No, he wouldn't. That's why, that's why I'm like this. That's why I choose to be this way. So you get it? Do you understand? I choose this way because it's safe. It's better this way. It's, it's much better this way. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not getting hurt anymore. No one can hurt me, not even God. You know what? Even if I thought about getting out, even if I wanted to, 
I know how I put myself into this. But I don't know how to get out. Are you free today? Has there ever been a time in your life when maybe you felt just like this man? The bondage of someone else? Has there ever been a time when maybe you felt like that you had a straight jacket upon you? Maybe somebody had control of you or something had control of you? And maybe you wanted out of it, but you weren't able to become free? You know, this is Independence Weekend, and we think of freedom. But this young man wasn't free. Somebody put him in that straitjacket. Something put him in there. And the problem is this. Even if he wanted out of there, he didn't know how to get out of the straitjacket. When we think of freedom, we think of independence. We have the political freedom. We have liberty. We have religious freedom. We can go to church wherever we want to. And so we think of independence. This is called, or July the 4th was Independence Day. But when it comes to freedom, like what this young man was dealing with, it's not through independence. It is through dependence. And so there may be some of you here today. I don't know. I can tell you there have been time in my lives when I felt just like this young man. And I'm sure there may be some here today. And so we'd like to take a journey. I'd like to talk about the bondage that we might find ourselves in. And how do we get out of it? I'm going to put a scripture up here in just a few minutes from John chapter 8. It talks about freedom. Let me read it to you. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage in any man. How sayest thou, You shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is a servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the Son abideth ever. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And so the Bible says, if you know the truth, the truth shall make you free. And so we are dependent upon the truth to be free. I'd like to take you through some of the journeys that you might um, think about concerning bondage. And I know we live in a free country. And most of us sitting here probably thought, you know, I've never been in bondage before. I am as free as I can be. I guarantee you, not a day goes by, but what I find myself in some type of bondage. Either that which I have caused, or that which somebody else has caused, or something has caused in my life. And I want to look at this today because I Remember those times when I was so much in a straitjacket and how I got out of it and how that we can get out of that bondage into freedom. God never intended for us to be in bondage. Did you know that? He never intended for us to be in a straitjacket. Isn't it sad that so often we never experience the freedom that God has given to us like the man in the drama, even if I wanted to get out of this straitjacket, I do not know how. You probably have heard of Harry Houdini, the great escape artist. I love to see the pictures dangling off of a crane somewhere upside down, getting out of that straitjacket. You probably have seen those before. Maybe they put him down in a tank of water, and he's trying to get out of there. And they put him in handcuffs. And there's never been a pair of handcuffs that ever held him. He could always get out of them. He could always get out of the straitjacket. Every cell, prison cell that they ever put him in, he got out of it. 
except for one. It was in the British Isles. They put him in the cell, a very simple cell. He spent two hours on the lock trying to get out of that cell. He got frustrated. Always before, he was out within a minute or two. Not this time. Two hours, frustrated. Finally, he just gave up. He leaned up against the door of the, uh, of the cell, and the door just came open. It wasn't locked to begin with. But you know, we laugh at that. But I think that's true with life. Sometimes we work very hard on trying to get out of the bondage that we find ourselves in, not realizing, you know, the door was never locked. God never intended for it to be locked. And so I want to go through some of the bondages that I think of, and you follow in your bulletin. The first one is sin-inflicted bondage. Sin-inflicted bondage. You need not live under the domination and condemnation of sin. And yet so often we find ourselves under the condemnation of sin. Sin-inflicted bondage. You know, that's why Jesus came to this earth. That's why he went to the cross so that there would be no more domination of sin in our life and no condemnation. And yet so often, even after becoming a Christian, I find myself still dominated by sin in my life. We need not live there. I, I, I've seen people live year after year in a stronghold, in a straitjacket. They cannot move forward in their lives. They're in bondage, sin. But I want to make a little journey this morning. Maybe you can relate to some of these things I'm going to talk about. The second one is self-inflicted bondage. Self-inflicted bondage from the inside of our lives. Have you ever felt that you were insecure? I guarantee if I would ask you to raise your hands, many of you would say, you know, I have really experienced insecurity in my life. When I went to the job, I was afraid. I didn't know exactly what was going to happen. I was insecure. I felt like I was inferior. I know in pastoring so many years, I felt so much insecurity in my life. And I was in the bondage of that insecurity. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to get out of it. Every time I took another step forward, I was scared to death because I was so insecure. And then I would try to hide that insecurity in my life. There are many people that's in the bondage of worry. Uh, they spend their entire life with anxiety and worry. Worry about everything. You know, God never intended us for, to, to worry. He intended for us to be free. But... We're going to be dependent upon something to be free. Doubt. How often do we doubt? It's an inner self-inflicted bondage. Sometimes it's bitterness that we have. And we, it just destroys us. And we can't break out of it. And it has us pinned to the ground. And we just don't know how to get out of that bondage of bitterness, or unforgiveness, self-inflicted. These are things that we bring upon ourselves that puts us in bondage, in the straitjacket. And even when I'm there, even if I wanted to get out of it, I do not know how to get out of that bondage. We move from that self-inflicted inside bondage to the self-inflicted bondage from the outside. But I want you to think about something, that self-infliction that we have. Notice in your bulletin it said, what lurks inside our hearts can be downright creepy. And you know that to be true, don't you? You ever have some creepy stuff deep down inside you? And, and you, can't, you can't move forward? And whether it's the insecurity, whether it's the bitterness or whatever it might be, it's that, that creepy stuff that lurks inside our hearts. Here's a statement that I learned a long time ago. 
and it's so valuable to life. And if you just pick up on this statement today, it will help you concerning the bondage that you may find yourself in today. We don't see things as they are. We see them as we are. We see them through our eyes. They may not be that way. We don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. And so if this bondage is going on in my life, that's the way I look at all my relationships. Everything that I do, I see them through the eyes of that bondage. The self-inflected bondage from the outside could be some of these things. It could be pornography, getting caught up in uh, watching on uh, uh, television or the movies or the magazine or on the Internet. And I can tell you there's multitudes of people that are in a straitjacket of pornography today. Now, God never intended for you to be there, if that should be you. And I hope it's not. Sometimes it was just, well, I think I'll just take a click and just see what that stuff's all about. And then it gets control. And the first thing you know, it has us in a stronghold. And then we can't move. And we're in a straitjacket, in a bondage. God never intended for us to be there. And we can be free, but we have to find the path to that freedom. I think of drugs and alcohol. And these things that can so much, I can remember back so many years ago when I was a teenager, how that I was under the control of cigarettes. Not that it was a, a sinful thing, uh, as far as the Bible doesn't say, Al, thou shalt not smoke. But I knew it wasn't good for me. As a matter of fact, when I go in and see a doctor today and they take my medical records and they say, uh, do you smoke? And I say, no. And they'll say, what did you smoke before? And I'll say, yes. And they'll say, what, uh, how long ago was it when you quit? And I'll tell them, you know, almost 50 years ago. And they'll say, well, how many did you smoke? And because it wasn't good for my health. But I never will forget. And so if you're here today and, and that's part of your habit, I'm not condemning you on what you're doing. I'm just telling you that what happened to me, that little thing, one day I held up before me and I said, you control me because I was in the bondage of that little cigarette. I could very well have become under the bondage of alcohol when I was a teenager if I had not caught myself during that period of time. Let me give you a scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 12. I love this scripture. Can we get that up there? It's a, uh, it, it's a scripture that will help you concerning anything that may be from the outside, such as pornography, alcohol, drugs, or something like that, that may be capturing you and, and has you in a straitjacket. Here's a great scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. They're not profitable. In other words, the smoking of the cigarette was lawful for me, but it wasn't expedient. It wasn't profitable because it was hurting my health. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Look at that word power. I will not be brought under the control of anything outside, such as pornography, alcohol, whatever you might want to put in that, or another person. Because I would imagine there probably are some here today that you may be under the power and the control of another person as an adult. The great scripture. That scripture has helped me so many times. Whenever I would think I'm going to do something and I would say, I am not going to be under the power of whatever it is that is trying to control me. The next one I want to point out is somebody inflicted bondage. Somebody inflicted bondage. It could be a parent. It could be children that are inflicting their parents. It could be a spouse. It could be an ex-spouse. See, I know a 61-year-old lady today 
that is in total control of her 85-year-old mother. And you know how she lives life? Just like this young man was living life right here. She's in a straitjacket. She doesn't know how to break out of it. She doesn't have freedom. Her mother has controlled her all of her life. But on the other hand, I've seen children who control their parents. And the parents don't know how to break out of it. But the kids, they know what they're doing. They know the system. And mom and dad just follow along. You know, you can be under the control of a pastor. Did you know that? In bondage. Let me give you an example. I'm going to use my wife today. She's hiding somewhere. I'm not sure where she's at. When I first began ministry, I was a legalistic type. And women were supposed to wear dresses, which is fine, but they weren't supposed to wear slaps or jeans or anything like that. And so over a period of time, I began to change in my thinking. And over a period of time, my wife uh, began to wear slacks. And I can remember a few times we wanted to come into Wichita, go out to the shopping mall and do some shopping, and she'd put a dress on. And I said, well, what are you doing this for? She said, well, we may see Pastor so-and-so at the shopping mall, and what is he going to say? Really? What difference does it make what he's going to say? But she was under the control of that pastor. Now, she's broken out of that. She's sitting back there with slacks on right now. And you know, she's a bad example, I guarantee you. <laughs> but, um, but we went through this. Now, doesn't that sound crazy? It sounds crazy, doesn't it? But you know, churches can put pastors in bondage too. In 1983, we were in Denver, Colorado. We were going through a counseling session for about eight days, and different people would come into that counseling session, and they were teaching us how to counsel. And they were also counseling us. And um, there was a, a young man and his wife from uh, uh, Seattle. And uh, he had been pastoring a Lutheran church. And he was just a young man. And they fired him because he was preaching the Word of God. He was preaching about Jesus. And they said, we don't want that in this Lutheran church. Now, that's not all Lutheran churches, but that was that particular one. And I never will forget this poor kid. I mean, you know, he's like 23, 24, 25 years old, wife with a little kid. Eight, eight days went by, and that poor guy, I felt so sad. He was so depressed. And um, we went through that whole session. And finally, on the last day, we were all sitting in chairs in a row, and we were being taught about freedom. And this young pastor, I never will forget, he jumped up on a chair. I wish I could demonstrate it for you. I couldn't get up on a chair, but... Uh, I wish I could demonstrate for He jumped up out of his chair, and he began to just yell, Thank God they fired me. Thank God they fired me. I'm free. I'm free. Man, I looked at him, and I thought, You must be crazy. <laughs> Did you see what he was saying? They had him in bondage, and he broke out of it. Now, he could have stayed there for the rest of his life, but he got out of it. You know, early in my ministry, again, um, I taught some things in the legalistic area that really put people in bondage. And I really feel sorry for those people today because some of them are still there. And so a couple of years ago, one of my sons and I went to Bristol, Tennessee to the races. And we stayed with a family. They were just a young family in the church of McPherson that I was pastoring. And um, I taught them all these things about don't go to movies, don't do this, don't do that. I never taught them anything about what you can do. It was always don't do this and don't do that. Well, you know, over 40, I hadn't seen her for 40-some years. And we stayed at her house. And so we're sitting at the table. She fixed a nice meal. And she said, I understand that you've really kind of gone, well, she didn't use the word liberal, but she said, you know, it kind of made me feel bad, what she was saying. And so I sat there and listened to her for a while. And, and man, she really read me the riot act. You know, she had to dress on down to here. And all her kids had dresses on down to here. And, you know, the, the, the look. A super spiritual type of thing. And so she just really, she said, 
don't you know you're going to stand before God someday? And yeah, yeah, I know that. She said, well, aren't you afraid? And I said, no, not really. I made the decisions. This is what I felt like God wanted me to do, and I think everything's okay. And she said, well, boy, I don't know. She said, what, what kind of music is it that you have in your services and all these different things? And finally, um, she said, aren't you afraid of God? And I said, not really, Maxine, but man, I'm afraid of you. <laughs> man, I said, you're really letting me have it. Well, it wasn't that we came back home, and a couple weeks later, I got this letter from him. I mean, it was two or three-page letter telling me, you know, I'm probably going to spend the rest of my life in hell or whatever it was. But anyhow, uh, I'm free. <laughs> and you know something? She's not. But you know who put her there? I did. And there wasn't any way I could help her to come out of it. She'll have to learn exactly what I've learned on how to be free. Here's a thought. You need to think for yourself rather than allowing others to think for you by adopting their opinions. You need to think for yourself. Others, their opinions, that's all they are. Borrowed thinking has little power in your life. Sometimes we even with the television, the pundits and everything that we listen to, the politicians, we get to thinking like they think. You know, I do my own thinking. You know, what they think may be right, it may not be, but I'm not going to be under bondage to them because you think for yourself. Borrowed thinking gives you no power whatsoever in your life. And so often we find ourselves in bondage because we think like somebody else thinks. And then the last one is something inflicted bondage, something such as finances, health, work, or whatever it may, may be. And so I just gave you a list of those things that are on the inside, the outside, somebody, something. You may be saying, wow, you know, I never really thought about it, but I'm in bondage right now. Maybe to the one of the things that we talked about today. Here's the deal. There's a camera, just like what we have back here in your life and you're the cameraman and whatever it is that is bothering you whether it's something somebody self-inflicted inside or out you operate the camera and you focus on it and it captures you and that's where you stay and you don't know how to break out of it and so let's look at the freedom I wanted to paint a picture of the bondage. In almost 45 years of pastoring, I have been there. I have dealt with so many people that are in bondage and so many people that want a plan to get out of the bondage. They'll come to a counselor for a plan. And that's great. And they'll come to a pastor for a plan. And they'll go to another pastor for a plan because the plan hasn't worked. Well, I'll go see somebody else. Maybe they got a plan for me. How do I get out of this mess that I find myself in? How did this young man get out? Well, if he just had a plan, if I just go see Pastor Bruce, he'd give me a plan, and then I could get out of it. Look, there's nothing in this scripture that says a plan will set you free. No, the Bible says that the truth will set you free and make you free, and then you can start implementing a plan. That's how it works. So let's look at the plan that God has for us, the freedom. There are two things man has been searching for ever since man has been searching for anything, and those two things are truth and freedom. People all over the world are looking for truth and freedom. Truth sets us free from the bondage of ignorance. We ask such questions about truth. What is right and what is wrong? What really matters? What has meaning? What has purpose? What can I stake my life on? What can I trust? What is real? What is genuine? We want to know truth. We search for it in the lab, in the classroom, 
on Google, in the home, we are constantly searching for truth. But what must we depend upon? I'm going to put one more scripture up here. And it's very clear. John chapter 8, verse 36. Listen to it. One little phrase. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Now here's the deal. When it talks about truth, it isn't necessarily talking about the truth of the Bible, though that is a part of it. Don't misunderstand me. What Jesus is saying in chapter 32, the truth, if you know the truth, the truth will make you free. And then verse 36, he says, and so if the Son sets you free, then you're free indeed. So he's really saying that the truth is Jesus himself. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so it is Jesus that sets us free. So here's, here's the deal. There's a, there's a camera on the inside of us. And we are the cameraman. And we're going to have to refocus upon Jesus. Now, I want to talk about him for just a little bit. You know, salvation isn't a thing. Salvation is a person. Truth isn't a thing. Truth is a person. He's real. He's called Jesus Christ. Oh, he's a word I just throw around once in a while, and I read in the Bible, and, oh, yeah, I understand all that. Yeah, sure. I go to church on Sunday. Sure, I read my Bible. I give an offering once in a while. Yeah, I witness. Yeah, Jesus. Let me see. Jesus. Well, he was a little child in the manger, went up on the cross, put in the tomb. I think he's up at the Father somewhere at the right hand of him. Yeah, I... Jesus is a person that will set us free. See, the answer for this young man wasn't a plan. It was Jesus, the Son of God. He's real. He's alive. He's powerful. He's God Almighty. He will set us free if we choose to allow him to do so. The word know, if you know the truth, if you know the truth, it is more than just to understand the knowledge and to have the knowledge. You may say, well, I know the Bible from front to the back. I've known people that could almost quote the entire Bible. But when he talks about if you know the truth, He's talking about if you have experienced the truth. It's a, it, out of the original language, it means have you experienced Jesus Christ, not only for salvation. He died more than just for us to go to heaven. He died so that we could be free. That's who he is. If you experience him every moment, every day of your life, or do we just have a Sunday morning occasion time with him? Jesus, I never realized how great and how powerful Jesus is until I've experienced him in my own life. He set me free. I'm a free man today. I spent so much of my life in bondage. He's so precious. He so much wants to set every one of us free from the bondage, whether it's in our minds, insecurity, anger, or somebody that's trying to control us. I don't know how many times I've seen those have gone through divorces and, and their ex-spouse has just had them in so much control, so much bondage. And I will say to them, I say, let them go. Let them go. Set them free. Well, so I can't do that. I know you can't do that because you can't work your plan. But Jesus can set them free for you. That's who he is. That's who he is. Let me give you 
three more scriptures today, and then I'll be closing in a few minutes. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. This is taken from God's Word translation. God wanted his people throughout the world to know the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ living in you, giving you the hope of glory. Look at that. Christ living in you. Are you experiencing that right now? Christ living in you. Let me give you another scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 through 20, from God's word translation. Don't you know that your body is the temple that belongs to the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit whom you receive from God lives in you. You don't belong to yourself. You were bought for a price. So bring glory to God in the way you use your body. And then Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I want you to see so much. I have seen the struggles that I personally have gone through. And I'm so thankful for everyone that I've gone through. But I see so many people that are really in bondage. And that's not God's plan for you. God's plan is for us to be free. It's all about Jesus. So what you need is a new cameraman. You need to turn loose of the camera because you're always going to focus upon the negative things in your life. Those things that will destroy you, take you into bondage, you're going to always focus on those. This afternoon, somebody will say something to you, and boom, you'll be on that, and you'll be in bondage for the rest of the day. You're driving down the highway, somebody's going to cut you off, boom. You focused on that, and you're going to be doing all kinds of things to that guy up in front of you. You know what I mean? There it is. And your wife's going to say something to you this afternoon or in the morning, and you go, boom. And you're going to be in the bondage to her for the rest of the day. That's the way it works. You need a new cameraman. When those things happen, let Jesus operate it. He'll focus where it needs to be focused. And he will give you freedom. Freedom that only he can give. Now here's the scripture. If you know the truth, Jesus, truth. If you know the truth, he will set you free. He will set you free. Jesus said, so if the Son sets you free, then indeed you are free. That's the only way out. There isn't any plan that you ever have that you can get out of it. That's why this young man couldn't get out of it. Only one plan. If you know the truth, he'll set you free. If you know the truth, he'll set you free. If the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. That's a pretty good deal. Let's bow our heads if you would.